theme of the session is to dig into challenges of, uh, of a meaningful career, the journey of an entrepreneur. And I think it was a couple of months ago that I just jumped into your post on LinkedIn, uh, where you were just, you were actually sharing your journey, setting up eCenter, which today is a million dollar company with employees, right, all over the world. Uh, so congrats on that. Six countries, project in all, con in five continents. And as you say, you are just getting started. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kudos to that. Uh, and I've been following your journey on LinkedIn, but I couldn't really grasp uh, all you were going through. So I really appreciate that post on LinkedIn. That made me realize that uh, uh, it's not always an easy journey, right? And it's so important to have a clear vision of where you want to get. So you were born and grew up uh, in India, then moved into the States where uh, you had your education and then there you stayed uh, and started up uh, your company. Maybe I give you just a minute if you want to introduce yourself. And, and I'm a beneficiary of this community. So me being here is purely selfish and I hope it is the same for you because I love meeting the community that EBBF brings together always since I've been connected. Um, I'll introduce a little bit about me. And I think what I'll do is I'll not give too many details because that will come out as we go through the journey of answering questions and having the conversations. I'm, I don't know about you guys. I'm already very intrigued about what you guys are working on. I'm really like my brain is exploding and I'm, I'm starting to have ideas. What must Tobin be doing? You know, what, what is they are working on? What, is, what does Alex do besides having such a cool name that sounds like another <laughs> F1 driver's name? I want to know everybody's story, but let me give a quick introduction of myself. So I'm Dairya Pujara. You can call me D if it's simpler. I have a complicated name and I get it. Uh, if anyone's interested, my name is a Sanskrit word, which means patience and courage. I'm very sure about the courage part. Uh, so I, I founded the company called Y Center. We are a global experiential learning, innovation, consulting, and design organization. But that's my complete introduction, which is not relevant right now. That's not what this is about. Coming back to my introduction, I founded the company. Um, I've got the privilege of traveling around the world with my work around 30, uh, around four continents, five continents, I guess, and uh, working in multiple countries. As of today, we are doing work in 30 plus countries. I have a master's degree in biomedical engineering and I was a cancer researcher when I was a grad student. I quit my corporate job on first day, eight hours. So that's my corporate experience. I'm assuming that's very less than a lot of you have here, probably. Uh, if anyone beats me to that, I would love to hear that story. And uh, took off to live in a small country, beautiful country, uh, south coast of uh, African continent called Mozambique. Spent half a year living there, learning a new language. And that's where really the foundation and genesis of my company began from. My entrepreneurial journey to speak, my journey of service, my journey of creating a purposeful, meaningful career. And... Uh, I've, I've done all this work with governments, with Fortune 500 companies. I've had the privilege to work with many entrepreneurs, almost building 100 plus companies with these entrepreneurs around the world. And they went on to raise money, create jobs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I've, I'm living in US with my wife and my three-year-old daughter in upstate New York. If anyone visits here, you are all welcome. I'd love to host you. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Let's get started to hear your questions. I do have one line about this session. Uh, I'm actually doing a similar conversation next week in New York City. And this is what I told the organizers to write in the description. And I'm going to just quote that. No questions are off limit when it comes to entrepreneurship and business or meaningful career. So bring your curiosity, your anxiety, your inquisitiveness, and whatever it means that will get you a real perspective about starting, running, quitting, any of those things you want to talk about, bring it here. I'm all about it. Load your questions onto me today. So I have a long list of questions I would love to ask Ooh. him. But if any of you would like to start, if you came up with an interesting question during your brief conversation. I guess the way on your website, as I was briefly there, I saw the Venn diagram. Well, you didn't draw one, but I saw it when you're talking about experiential, global experiential learning, innovation, consulting, and design organization. And of course, where, where the center where they overlap, I'm assuming, is really that's the, uh, the human-centered design framework. I'd you love for it. you to explain the overlap in the Venn of the different categories that make 
the human centered design framework in the middle and how those how they're connected that's a great question tobin um here is a dirty little secret which only you guys are getting on this call and that's why you didn't see that venn diagram on my website did you you didn't right yeah see the venn diagram gives you a perspective you have this different figures you put them together and the center you have a common element i love math and physics but you will not see a venn diagram there the reason being we actually didn't do that at y center we didn't create the circles first and put them together we only had human center design to begin with so we started from the center we started saying whatever we do in with our organization it has to be human centered now what can we do with being human centered the first thing we found the first application we found go to see my own journey of graduating from university serving in a remote village in africa and finding out my college education didn't prepare me for solving real problems so the first thing i did with starting y center was create a learning program experiential learning that's what i did for first 6 years that's it no consulting no design just working with other students with a promise to myself i don't want any student to stand in the world and say oh wait i don't know how to do this even though you actually went to college to study it because see that's not the job of college if you if we were having this conversation 15 like 10 years earlier i would have used some really hard words about formal education system i chose not to do that because that may sometimes come out to be disrespectful i won't do that and i also realized and evolved my own thinking that that's not the job of college they give you a foundational theoretical knowledge the real experiential piece you only get it by engaging with real people by serving people by working with the people not just for them and that was the first application of human centered design so the heart was the first thing that came and then came this three circles i hope that kind of answers you how that happened Uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, I can answer how it happened. The, the beginning was I, I get the center, and then you added the circles. But I'm curious to hear the overlap of where they came from one to another, as because you, you, you started with the center, but then you created the circles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And exactly. where was the overlap that that evolved them to become what it is? Um, this is amazing because we start with learning, and then I have companies come and tell me, we realize we don't want consulting. We also want to learn first. We need to build capacity. So I was just doing experiential learning for universities. and the company started coming to us and saying we need this i got my first company we did it and they said hey this is good the learning piece is good you now you actually planted the idea of this human centered design in all of our employees but how do we actually practice it can you do you know can we hire you as a consultant and i'm like of course i wouldn't say no even though i've never done that my corporate experience is 8 hours that's not going to help any corporate you know hire me so i'm like yeah absolutely i do this all the time you know how it how it works with startups So I get my first consulting gig with a Fortune 500 company, which is a very weird place to start. I didn't start with a mid-size, a big, but a really large publicly trading company <clears throat> who hired me to be their consultant. And then one after the other, the word of mouth. I've always spent zero dollars in marketing or PR. You know, one led to the other, and we had other companies that came to us saying we want the same thing, and that led. to creating a design team as well because some of our consulting clients wanted a technical product and i had a tech team in house who was sitting idle and then pandemic happened and everybody wanted to build some kind of tech to you know solve their problems remotely and i'm like i have a team and you know we are in the business of solving problems let's give it a shot so my first client happens to be american government i don't know why how it happened and you guys as i speak i just realized a very weird story the presentation i created for that first a design plan american government i made a video and in that video there is actually an ebbf 2 second clip it's i i'll share it with you daniel and you are in you are actually in my video daniel it's so unreal i'm just realizing that now but i'm i put together a video and in that there is one of the ebbf video in that video that is a strange but yeah so tobin i was being i was being reactive to what was coming my way as an entrepreneur and we continuously pivoted and we were flexible because we are human centered we are like okay if this is what people needs we try to give them we, we may not be good at it but we learn on the job that's i think the core of any entrepreneur you learn on the job so you have mentioned uh, uh serving people what what does it mean to you to serve people yeah that's a big question right so it it actually evolved the first time i got exposed to the concept of serving was obviously growing up in india and um serving i mistakenly made me believe that the person who serves is at a higher position and the person who is being served is relatively speaking in a different and 
you know, maybe not the same level as the person who's serving. That thing got destroyed when I went to Africa. That theory was completely destroyed. I'm like, first, that may be a model of service, but I didn't subscribe to that service where you come from a position of power because I don't think that was serving even the server very well. Um, slowly, with my experience of, especially with my experience of working in Mozambique, I felt the first need for service to be efficient as for people to be on a similar position, similar level. The server has to acknowledge in this case that the server and the one being served are in a bilateral relationship and not balance or tipping on one side as opposed to another because they both get a value. The person who serves also gets a value. It could be joy. It could be satisfaction of serving. It could be money in some case. It doesn't matter. But the server also gets something and the one who's being served has to definitely get something, obviously. Put that in context of a restaurant. You know, even there, the server and the one being served, they do get things, but they get different things. So I feel service. Every service has a bilateral relationship where what the each party gets is very different. It, it mostly is never the same. There could be some common threads, happiness, satisfaction, some of those things, emotions, that could be common. But really the matter of what's being served and what you're serving, they each parties have to have their things known. It has to, you have to have an intention to serve. You need to know what that intention is. When you don't have that and you just jump into service, I found in my experience, it could mislead you. It could, you know, because here is an example. I want to be specific. Sometimes people go into the service with a very selfish goal of, I'm going to do this because I'm going to change the world. The world needs me. I'm, I'm this awesome genius. You know, I'm, I'm, I have so much to give to everybody. Uh, my favorite talk of a Brazilian entrepreneur, uh, industrialist, Richard Semler, I think, he had a quote in his TED talk saying, you know, billionaires talk about giving up their wealth after they've had a lot of it. He said, I have a genuine problem with that statement because it sounds like you took more than you deserve. And then you have this compulsive need to give back. That doesn't seem to me like a good service model to me. Where you, you know, I, I hear this, I need to give back. I don't serve because I have a need to give back. I just think that's how we operate. We serve each other. That's how we came where we are today in the world. I don't come from a place of position of power where I feel I have a need to serve. But no, nobody asks for my service. You know, I, I in, in the equation of service, me, if I'm, if I'm the one who's serving somebody, I put myself low or even below the one who is being served. And that actually allows me a lot of learning, a lot of empathy for the community I work with. Um, and most importantly, the joy and satisfaction of collaborating with someone. For me, service is actually a very cool collaborative medium as well. Because if I want to serve somebody, if they don't want to be served, then it's not happening. As I mentioned, it's a bilateral relationship. I've heard so many times, so I'm going to go and do this. I'm like, yeah, but do they want you to do this for them? Well, how do you know that you're being required? How do you know you actually have a value to give to somebody? How do you know you are going to enhance somebody's life? Do you know those things? Or are you just doing it purely out of the fact that you're going to get paid for this? That equation is broken and it is not sustainable. You better know what each part is getting out of this. So I now go from a place of service where I know I'm required. I know I have something to either offer or something to take away from it. If not, it's not a good model. I take it, people don't think of service as collaborative in nature, necessarily speaking. I, I, I completely disagree and I'm, I'm open to ideas. I'm open to cha being changing my mind. I do that all the time. We are human beings. My idea of service is collaboration. If it's not collaborative, I don't think it's a good service model. So that's my idea, Martino. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, it is great. I mean, it's a two-way relationship, right? And the importance of uh, cooperation, I think, in one of our conversation, you also, uh, you were telling me that uh, it feels good uh, to not having this pressure to solve all the problems of this world by yourself, right? Uh, but yeah, that you can you call yeah, you can contribute to the betterment of this world uh, as far as you do it in cooperation with uh, with other people, right? Uh, before you were mentioning solving solving problem, which, yeah, yeah, which can mean jumping from one situation to another, right? But uh, uh, you have mentioned also the difference between problem solving and solving the problem or solving the solution. I did. Where yeah, did, we, right. did we talk about this before? We, we, talk, we talked oh, about we, it before. Okay. So Problem solving and solving problem. They seem so naive. 
I just jumbled the words, but they seem like same to most people. For me, it's very different. This part is my most favorite part, but also my wife hates this because she's like, "What are you doing? You're getting too technical. Don't bore me." Uh, but I'll bore you people because I think you elected to be bored by me, I guess. Um, so we were two years ago. Me and my team, we were sitting and we were discussing what do we really do? Like, what are we working on? And so we said, "Oh, we solve problems." And I'm like, "Okay, if, if that's what we do, let's see how many problems have we solved in the last five years." And we're like, "Not many, actually. We've solved some important ones, but not co- are they completely solved?" No. What did we really do in this so-called we solve the problems theory? We actually went. We worked with people. They are the ones who solve the problem. So can I claim ownership of solving that problem? And then I realized, wait, we're not solving the problem. We're doing problem solving. The problem part comes first. Very important for us. Not solving problem. Solving problem seems like I'll be successful when I have solved that problem. Problem solving for me is it, it's more of it has two parts in it. One. is focusing deeply deeply in understanding the problem it comes from this guy who is in my back wall albert einstein who was who is known to be a physicist but also a philosopher one of his quotes if i have an hour to solve the problem i'll spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and probably 5 minutes talking about solution i'm i love that quote we do the same so we start with the problem we focus on people and what it means for people to go through that problem that's the empathy piece and the solving follows the problem it, it it will happen if solving should be so obvious at the end of it that we are not required when i was working on my malaria project in mozambique i was asked by somebody what is the goal with this project uh it was a small business we created actually to solve the problem of malaria in sub saharan africa and i said it will sound weird but my goal is to be out of business i don't want to be solving malaria for next 50 years because that means i'm clearly doing a pathetic job <laughs> you know it's like saying what what do you guys do and i'm like we are solving world hunger i'm like okay how long you been doing this we have been successfully operating for last 30 years i'm like i'm sorry you clearly are doing a terrible job if you've been working on this for 30 years you still haven't solved it uh, my mentor told me don't work on solving hunger problem work on eliminating that problem solving is not helping us you know just like that's your ultimate vision so yeah problem solving comes from a place of focusing on problem and people and the solving part is literally the least important for me because i think you know this is also important in how when i go to this events networking events or any of this people say i'm working on an app that does this and i'm like you lost me at the app see because you started with the solution you started with the medium of how you solve the problem i don't care i would like get my attention with what's what's wrong with the world and why that matters to you so if you tell me oh i i'm working on solving malaria or i'm working on fighting malaria with an app okay now the app part comes because see the app is irrelevant 10 years from now maybe there are no apps in the phone maybe there's no idea of the phone as we think you know because phones were not even supposed to be looking like this they were going they were wired so if graham bell comes today and looks at this and say wait i, I didn't invent this thing that's not my invention um phones are not supposed to be like this it's the same theory we have to not worry about the app or the website or the tech you know which we think are the solutions we have to focus on problems problems and problems and people of course that face this problem the solution part is going to be much easier so yeah problem solving and not solving problems because there's a huge part of focusing on problems tobin is that a question or this is about i think it was a reflection actually the, i was looking at yeah. destination versus journey thinking the idea is being reactionary to something versus proactive mm. that's what mm. i was hearing from what you were saying so it's kind of i guess always my clarifying in mm. a question but without a question is the idea of mm. Got working it. on this thing kind of happiness i don't write be do have i don't yeah. do have be i'm be yeah. happy to have and so it's that switch of the thinking would you say that this approach brings you actually to have a meaningful career you know what i'll be literally killed for picking up on this thought of tobin because before i came to this yeah. i had i had a quick dinner bite my wife and i had a heated and intense debate about destination versus journey <laughs> heated so if i have if I, and she's sitting in my audible zone right now uh you know we work from home so okay i'm already apologizing i'm sorry but here is what i have to say about that <laughs> john so i was just telling and i'll be honest i i had an opinion that i shared with her but now i'm going to say something completely opposite you know it's weird but i'll also explain myself so a big believer 
huge believer in journey thinking not destination thinking big believer journeys are beautiful journeys have stories and the destination story when anybody says i have a story about destination they also mean they have a story about journey actually it's never the story of the journey destination destinations are boring because now we stop i've heard i've i've read about people who climb mount everest and they said when i reached there i was there only for 10 minutes so what i really took back is climbing and coming down which was most part of my journey but staying on the top of everest nobody can stay more than 20 minutes because they run out of oxygen so when they reach there yeah you have this big aha moment but you you are breathless you literally are counting for your life you're like when the hell do i get out of this i need to breathe you know they call that death zone when you're climbing everest the top uh, i think 2 hours of the everest cl climbing and coming down so the journey thinking suddenly brings a lot of perspective that you know if you haven't done it properly you haven't saved your breaths to even enjoy a moment when you reach there the destination holds no meaning the journey is what counts so big believer in journey thinking i think destinations yeah are, are overrated in some cases i actually i think my google map bio or something i've written a, a, a traveler without a bucket list i really i have never created a bucket list for i'm a traveler without i do travel a lot but i have no bucket list in my life like never had when it comes to destinations i don't i when i look at somebody's picture or somebody tells me you should go to Spain. i've been to malaga but when i reached malaga martina is when i found out about malaga it was never my dream to go to malaga i've been to spain you know a few countries here and there none of those countries were on my i don't have dreams of getting somewhere i have dreams of continuing to be able to do that that is really my dream can i continue to have journeys that is if if that can be called a dream i don't have dreams of getting somewhere or reaching somewhere and there was a poet somebody may know the name of the poet which is a quote i'm going to leave you all with in this context if you don't know where you are going you certainly will get there i love that would you say that that apply to your entrepreneurial journey as well shockingly yes i'll tell you why shockingly because anybody who asked me 5 years ago where do you see yourself you know with why center where is it going i'm like i don't know where i'm going imagine saying that you are an investor you know you are in a pitch round and your investor is like where are you going with this all, all this crazy thing i don't know where i'm going an english poet told me just keep going and you'll reach there that's a terrible answer for your investor that's a terrible answer for your partner terrible answer for your parents terrible answer for everybody who is you know supporting you who is so we're, you know watching for your win and you're like i don't know where i'm going wow that's great like look at this guy you know he's just running um here is the problem i really don't know in my head again because i don't have a destination thinking i the reason i don't have a destination thinking i can't comprehend that destination in my mind because i don't know if it exists you know it's so surreal it's so visually large metaphorical metaphorically large i don't even know if i can even put words to it so i that's usually how it would come out as that i don't know where i'm going of course in my head i know what i want to achieve in that sense of what the company should look like what all of that should happen um i'll give another example because we're talking about meaningful career why is that important just a week ago one of the largest companies in the world which was about to be our client uh told us that we are too small as a company why center to talk about ethics and values that is exactly the line they used because my team member told them this is against our values they did something that was against our values so we said that this is against our values and against the ethics they said you are too small you know you guys don't know how to do business are you sure because th this has never happened in the history of our business some a vendor tells us they don't want to work with us everything was done the contract was almost signed but uh, we said no so they called me and they literally used the words i am i'm for with my folded hands i'm requesting you not to do this please work with us and we decided not to do that uh the reason being is we are interested in the journey we know that the journey with them is not going to be good we, it, the destination looks great by the way we will get paid we will have a very good logo to put on our website that we work with this client so that's a destination but because we don't think in terms of destination and we think in terms of journey we didn't take the project so my journey destination thinking also enables us not just my to credit of my whole organization everybody who works with voice and they all believe we all somehow came together because of our shared values so yeah i think big believer of that and along this journey if i we put it 
as a journey towards a meaningful career, any hiccup that uh, is worth mentioning, any difficult moments, just to make sure that everyone feels less lonely in this journey. The, the part about loneliness, yeah, uh, it feels lonely, but you're not alone. I'm sure everybody buys that. That is absolutely the truth. It feels very lonely, but here's a fact. We are not alone in this. Everybody's lonely together, you know, which is what we also saw in pandemic. It is so, it's weird, but it, it can also bring a lot of hope. Wait, there's other person also who is lonely. So we are all lonely together, but we are together. That's important to note. So Martina, you asked any hurdles, any challenges? Most of them are hurdles and challenges. I think Alex was asking me the question and we were discussing in our breakout room as well. Um, this, a friend of mine had sent me uh, an article which had a picture of entrepreneur's life. January, you know, starts, I'm not feeling that great. February, you get a project and you're like, wow, you know, I, 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 I'm, do, I'm getting somewhere. March, you get money. You're like, I'm the king of the world. I'm the next, you know, biggest entrepreneur the world has ever seen. April, the project ends. You don't have other projects. You're like, wait, what am I doing with my life? You know, I don't know how to run a business. Uh, May, you have three proposals gone out. June, one of them works. And you're like, okay, it's not that bad. So, you know, it's a roller coaster. So my friend sent me this picture and said, does this happen to you? I'm like, no, this is inaccurate. This is completely inaccurate. This doesn't happen to me across January to December. This happens from nine to five every day. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I feel great. You know, this is it. Like, this is my moment. By 12 o'clock, I'm already beaten with five emails that I received saying, we don't want to work with you. Your proposals suck. Uh, there's nothing in common we have. We are sorry that we even talked to you. Bye-bye. Don't want to talk to you ever again. And now you are like literally contemplating your whole life by noon. And then you have a good slice of pizza. And by one o'clock, you are again happy because, uh, you know, you have that rush of good hormones in your body. Happiness is such a superficial emotion sometimes when it has to be, you know. My, my professor told me, don't chase for happiness, go for contentment. And you'll never reach that, by the way. So, yeah, so closest thing that comes to me is pizza. Yeah, Martina, <laughs> I seek happiness there. Uh, but uh, the, the part about being hurdles and challenges I was telling uh, Alex is, it's going from zero to one. It's not, you know, if you ask me what is the most difficult part, mathematically speaking, you multiply zero by everything, you are still going to get zero. So the zero to one is the biggest journey. Once you are at one, you are at 10, you will have supporters, you will have people who want to work with you. Tobin, you know, going back to that question, my first one, getting that first consulting client, I made it sound simple. It was terrible. It was very, we had like, it was very difficult. We were challenged, we were ridiculed, everything happened in between. Uh, but the third and the fourth were not that bad. And we came to a place where I'm telling no to a, one of the largest companies in the world that I don't want to work with you because your values don't match with me. But that journey of three years, three and a half years, that was filled with challenges and hurdles every day. The worst one was the first one. First is the worst. So zero to one is the biggest hurdle. But Martina, if I have to talk about specific challenge, like, I, I really like, I don't know how, how, how should I pick one? Uh, I'm, and I'm happy to share, you know, if somebody maybe pro probes me with another question, maybe it will come out of me. I don't plan like what I want to speak, especially in, in, in a conversation like this. I, I want to really speak everything from my heart. I'm not filtering anything. This is how I speak every day uh, to everyone. This is me. Uh, but uh, the specific challenge part, I think, I'll challenge you guys. See if you can bring that out of me because I have all of, like, the life is full of challenges. There's just 10,000 of them to quote. I'm not just not sure which one should I pick right now that will actually uh, help you guys with what you are looking for. So I'm interested in listening what you are looking for. I have, one, I have one question yeah, about interactions, no? because that's what I find uh, the most value. Yeah. How do you create, what are some of the, really the best interactions with your clients and how do the, you make them meaningful? Because I'm, I can imagine many of the people in the call now are just saying, how do I approach conversations in a way to make them meaningful, useful and productive? So what are some things that cool. work for you? The first immediate uh, response to that is I use a tool, a very powerful tool to make interactions more meaningful in my professional life as well. And I'll give an example as well. So it will add some context. The tool is storytelling. Now it seems very obvious. Like, yeah, I know what he means by that. But here is an example. My first consulting project that I was talking about, I, I, I put on a suit. I wore a shirt. 
I don't do that usually. That's why it's a big deal. I did all of that because it's a corporate company. I go there and I have all this slide deck. I made all the slides. I'm sure you guys, you know, when you go to a new client, you 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 get in the zone of what the client you think needs from you. So I get in that zone. I reach there. The guy who hired me says, "The suit is nice, but very weird looking. You in that suit? Because I've never seen you in one, uh, like so for formally dressed. But it's okay. Can you show me your slides? Because you know the the MD, the managing director of the company is going to be sitting here. So I want to I want to like look at your slides and make sure there's nothing objectionable here. I looked at the slides and he's like." What is this? And I'm like, I prepared this for the session, the first session, you know, to introduce me, my company, and what we are going to do with your employees. Like, this is boring as hell. I didn't hire you for. If I wanted this, I would have got one of the big four consulting companies. You know, by the way, PwC KPMG is on my payroll. Like, I can get those consultants anytime I want. I hired you because you told me a story about your work in Africa. Where is that? I'm like, but wait, this is these are corporate people. Why will they care about me in a village? In a sub-Saharan African country, doing some work that has no meaning to most of the people in the room, he's like, "That's not your job. You share your story. I hired you for that." I'm like, "Okay, you sure?" He's like, "Yeah, go for it." Since that day, Daniel, until today, I realized what I thought was my weakness, my lack of corporate experience. I don't have anything to talk about. You know, when I was working here, I was on Wall Street and I worked on this five million dollar deal in like ten seconds. You know, that's my experience. So please hire me in your fintech program. I don't have that stories. I have a story of how I potentially help, you know, potentially going to help this year. This is a real story. 30 million small farmers in Africa to come out of poverty. That's a real project I'm working on. That's my story. But it, it's going to take me five years to get there. So when I start engaging with my authentic stories, even though sometimes they have no meaning to the audience I'm speaking with, they do like that, I realized, which I didn't know that for. So even with my, my clients, there are two types of businesses, transactional business and relational business. I keep it very relational, you know. So I'm talking about storytelling, which doesn't have a transactional value. I'm not going to be getting paid for that. That's not why they hired me to listen to stories. I'm not a podcast uh, teller, you know. When I go to this, they're like, "Oh yeah, let's pay Dairam money as a consultant. He shares great stories." That only gets that's for the relational part of the business to make the interactions more rich, more worthy, more meaningful, as we say. So storytelling, I think, is one of the most powerful tools to make your relational businesses more meaningful. And then, of course, you do what you have to do to make your transactional beings worthwhile for your businesses to work with you. But you have to have those two buckets. And I think we have managed to do that very clearly now. Have a relational bucket, very strong one. If I can go backwards, actually, I think you spoke to, um, when I was talking about the be, do, have, and happiness, the journey, you said you had actually an opposing view that you'd had previously with your partner uh, just moments before. And I love that you approached with curiosity, right? That's the vulnerability of curiosity is I'm willing to change my mind at any moment. I love to actually hear a little bit of uh, where your view was before that as you transitioned, yeah. if you don't mind sharing. Sure, absolutely, I can. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I'll find out the repercussions of this after the call. But uh, let me take the risk. So we were. she was telling me about a project she was engaged in, which is going to be helping her team a lot. Right? She works for. She works in a large corporate company, very different than my setup, which is a small startup, a very small, less number of people. The the impact that we have societal, that's different conversation. But the impact that I my company can have and theirs can have is different. They're a publicly trading company. It's very big. So she was telling me about the work she put out there, which is going to help like a lot of people in her company and potentially for a time to come. So I said, that's great. See, that's what matters in corporate world, that what you created is going to have that impact. Everything. And she said, yeah, but you know what? I've been working on this for two years, which is what got me here. That also matters. And I'm like, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Like I'm, But that doesn't matter. You know, in this case, the corporate would only care about what you created at the end, at the end of it. And how it's going to create the bottom line. You know, how many times have you heard? I, I care about the bottom line. I care about the bottom line. And I also said this with a caveat. This is unfortunate thinking on companies part. This is narrow thinking. So it's not that I believe in this. This is not my belief. This is not my style. I'm still a journey thinker. But unfortunately, a lot of big companies that I have come to know of, I'm not saying all of them. They have destination thinking. They're talking about the bottom line as the final destination. And that's why we pay the price in context of environmental harm, societal harm, morality uh, compromise. We see all kinds of stuff with a lot of companies because I think they have a destination thinking. It's it's uh, the blinder thinking, you know, that I have to get there. That's my stock price I have to hit. So I think in those companies that matter. So I was having 
a discussion with her where I said, you know, what you just told me, that's what matters. Everything you did for two years to get here, unfortunately, nobody's going to care about that. Uh, and she was obviously opposing that. She's like, how is that possible? There's no way I can get here if I didn't do that. I'm like, I agree. That's a fact. What I'm saying is nobody values that. And that's where the unfortunate truth comes out, you know, which is what I believe. I could be wrong. But what I've seen from some of my limited experiences with some companies, I felt that they were all destination players, not journey players. Uh, so, yeah, that was that's why I told him my view, my hypocrisy maybe comes into play. All right. Before we close, we are very close to the end. Uh, I'm just curious to, to ask you. Uh, something about uh, your growing up in India, because he said that was a big influence for you, right? Uh, watching inequality, particularly in terms of uh, uh, gender, race, uh, uh, based on kind of job, so social inequality. How how witnessing all of these has impacted impacted your your organization today and your way of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's a great question, Martina. Uh, so growing up in a country like India, usually what happens, which is what happened to me as well, you get desensitized to problems because you see them so much. I got desensitized at first. So when I came to the US and just after spending some time here is when I realized how, how some of the things are extremely broken back home. See, everything is broken or everything is perfect in relation to something else. So when an American complains about lack of freedom, I think they'll they're really talking about having a lack of perspective because they don't know what lack of freedom could mean in some other country, in other part of the world. Uh, my immediate reaction is very, very strong to an American telling me, oh, this country is changing. We don't have any more freedom in America. I'm like, please don't say that to me. I come from India. I've lived in other countries. So if you tell me that just, I'm open to discussing why you think that way. I'm not disregarding your feeling, but you know, that's not a very good statement I'm going to entertain. I want to know the story. So what happened in India is I get desensitized growing up. You know, seeing a homeless person come to you asking for money was a very common theme. And saying no to that person was very common without even thinking why they're doing that. Like, you don't, you don't have time to reflect because you're seeing them, so many of them on a single daily basis. On my journey morning growing up, like waking up in the morning and going to re reaching my undergrad college in Mumbai, I had to take a train, I had to take two different modes of transport, and I would see at least, if not, maybe 100 to 200 homeless people on the way, maybe more, actually. And I would interact with five of them at least because they would come to me and ask for money. Now, imagine doing that for 10 years of your life. or 20. You get desensitized. You're like, just go away, don't bother me. You, you stop even seeing people. So, so that is my foundation, which doesn't seem great, by the way, because that... You, it, the worst way to solve problem is to be desensitized to it. You have to be sensitive to the problems. Your desensitizing doesn't help. But when I came back to the US, that also didn't do the trick for me immediately. But then I went to Africa in Mozambique where I was working and then come, came back to US. Now suddenly having those three different perspectives, the first thing that hit me is, wait, what I saw in India was not normal. That was not how things are supposed to be. I was told that. Uh, so... When Y Center was started with the goal of working with American students, working in Africa and everything, I also, in 2015, immediately launched Y Center India with a goal to create problems in India. Uh, I mean, solve problems, solve, create problem solving programs in India. Uh, and maybe also, by the way, I, I know I misspoke create problems, but you, when you do create problem solving programs, you also do create problems, some of the problems. There are some, you know, unknown problems. We also, in our company, by the way, when we do these programs, we look at are we unintentionally adding something, adding fuel to the fire? Are we also creating something that we're not supposed to? Uh, here's a big example. I was doing a workshop in a top engineering school in India. And uh, it was a hackathon. You guys know what's a hackathon? You know, people like a bunch of IT, computer science students come. They don't sleep overnight. They code, code, code. They come up with a solution in 24 hours or less. So that's a hackathon. So we, we approached a university, one of the top universities in India, comparable to an Ivy League in America. So I'm talking about really reputed school. We tell them we want to do a hackathon. The dean of the school tells me, sounds great, but the girls or the women engineers, they have to leave at 10 o'clock in the night and go back to their hostels. The guys can stay back and continue hacking all night because it's unsafe for the girls to stay back after 10 o'clock. Now, obviously, this like pissed me off to the core. I'm like, I thought I'm dealing with a newer India and uh, it's getting better and all of that. And this is the reputed school. I'm like, wait, your 
your women in your college are not safe from are not safe on your own campus like i help me understand and, and they didn't even want to entertain an argument so what we did we ended up creating a program that was only for women engineers we like just forget this so let's just focus on creating a 100% women based program now see it seems all good you know it seems wow wow but i just what i did was i also shied away from having i didn't solve the root cause of the problem here you realize i just created an avenue to potentially solve the symptom of that problem i really didn't solve the problem have i changed any uh, equation of gender inequality in india no did i make it better for even those 15 women who joined our program next morning no i didn't it was only for those two days so when we do programs we also think about are we really doing long term problem solving are we inter- unintentionally creating other problems and sometimes we are like yeah we are just creating bandaid solutions you know this is not, we are just solving the symptom we are not even doing a problem solving here so the that story is very important because that forms the genesis of of, of my work at y center and that all comes from a lot of my experience of growing up in india uh, and seeing and by the way like the biggest example was i went to a private school in india most middle class people go to a private school in india uh, it's not the same concept like in america private school is affordable to the middle class in india and the lowest of the lowest class in india goes to public school that terrible but here is a quick interesting thing my mother is a teacher in a public school and because of that growing up some days when we didn't have daycare or they did my parents didn't have money to pay for daycare my mother would just take me to public school you know while she's teaching i would sit in a corner because there's nobody to take care of me so like un like not intentionally but unintentionally i ended up getting exposed to both school systems and as a result of that i get i got exposed to two different classes of society growing up that's a lot for a child who is you know just 8 year old now i realize that of course that time i didn't know that that time i just hated the fact that i'm not playing with my friends and i'm sitting in, i'm going to two schools same day that's just weird thought i just finished school in the morning i'm again in a school in an afternoon but in a much worse condition but i think eventually when when, when the dots connect backwards i look back and i realize that actually was very important part of who i became as a person i started appreciating what i didn't have in life what privilege means even in india you know even though i didn't grow up rich or anything i uh, family never owned a car in their life you know we always aspired we'll buy a car one day and you know like unfortunately i was the guy who was supposed to fulfill the dream but i quit my job and there goes the dream of buying the car for my family so you know i was not the best son to have i guess you know because i didn't fulfill that but eventually that that's for my parents to talk i guess uh but uh, yeah so that aspect of me has obviously shaped me and as a result my work and I, and i think it will continue to do so for good and interactions like this also help me get better because i get to reflect upon my own journey which we don't do otherwise when we sit down i don't think about these things when i'm you know eating my pizza but now yeah. i do i have to so thank I'm you running. thank you so much it has been excellent and thank you everyone for uh, for attending the call and participating with your question and your experience and uh, yes we we'll see each other next month we are going to share the the dates uh, in our website with our next guest Thank you Martina thank you Daniel thank uh, you for thank you everybody for being with us thank you everyone thank you Daria it was very interesting i have some things to think about <laughs> i'm glad thank, thank you everybody, everybody.